So if you look up toward the skies in the hour before dawn tomorrow, you'll catch sight not far above the southeast horizon of a bright spot of light. It'll soon fade from view as the sun rises, but if you were to look again a month, a week, or even a day later, you might be surprised to find that the spot of light has moved against the background stars. And that's because this particular point of light is what the ancient Greeks called a planetes, or wanderer. It's one of five that have mystified watchers of the sky since antiquity. The Greeks called this particular one Zeus. The Romans called it Jupiter. And for millennia, the king of the ancient pantheon wandered the skies, not much more than a curiosity amongst people who watched the sky. But then, on the 7th of January, 1610, a man in what is now northern Italy pointed a new invention towards this point of light. And what he discovered changed humanity's view of the universe forever. The device was the telescope. The man was Galileo Galilei. And the discovery was that Jupiter was a complex planet. It's orbited by its own system of moons. And that meant that Earth is not the center of the universe. Now, this discovery put Galileo on a collision course with the Roman establishment, but it set in motion a period of discovery that we see today, with robotic spacecraft being flung to the farthest corners of the solar system, many of them visiting Jupiter. Now, Jupiter's latest visitor is one that you may be familiar with. It's the NASA mission Juno, which has been orbiting the planet since July 2016 with dazzling results, but before we get to the ingenuity of the Juno mission, first, why Jupiter? Why are we interested in Jupiter? What's so special about this particular distant planet? Well, if you're a scientist, a poet, or a philosopher, Jupiter brings out the superlatives. So, in simple stats, it's the fifth planet from the sun, an absolute monster with a radius of over 11 times that of the Earth, it's the largest planet in the solar system. To put it in context, if you were to scrape together all of the mass in all of the other planets, moons, comets, asteroids, and other assorted lumps of rock in the solar system, you still wouldn't have half the mass of Jupiter. And as a planet, it's nothing like Earth. It's essentially a raging ball of hydrogen and helium with no solid surface. But there's... So Jupiter, it, you know, it, on statistics alone, it's an unforgiving planet. But there's something deeper, beyond size and beauty, that's going on here that I'd like to explore today. You see, the story of Jupiter is the story of the formation of the solar system, and by implication, us. And this is what gives Juno's mission special significance. By peering beneath the clouds, Juno is telling us, unlocking the secrets of our creation. It's sending back a picture of what happened four and a half billion years ago when we were nothing more than a collapsing cloud of dust and gas. You see, of all the planets in the solar system, we know that Jupiter must have formed first, simply because it was able to grab hold of most of the available gas and did so before the sun turned on and blew all the gas away. We know that Jupiter, once it formed, must have had a profound effect on the formation of the other planets in the solar system, including, of course, our own Earth and the sources of our own existence. You see, we forget often that over half of our body mass is water. We're, we're all essentially walking water bags, and yet many of us forget, or f don't often query, where did that water come from? Well, we've got strong reason to believe that the Earth's water was delivered by objects originating in the outer solar system that were flung in our direction by Jupiter's enormous gravity. And this is why we need to understand the history of Jupiter. But understanding Jupiter has implications for things going on in our everyday lives around us. 
Simple things like deciding whether we need to take an umbrella out with us depend on whether we can confidently write mathematical models that faithfully capture the behavior of a planetary atmosphere. Now, Earth's atmosphere is disrupted by landmass, making it notoriously hard to model. Uh, and I think this fact is, will be familiar to anybody who's been soaked on an otherwise pleasant walk in the Lake District. But Jupiter has no solid surface. So it's the perfect laboratory for testing our atmospheric models. If we can make them work on Jupiter, then we know our models and our understanding of planetary atmospheres is correct. This is what Jupiter holds for scientists. And that's why all eyes are on this little fella. Now, we knew that Jupiter wouldn't give off its secrets lightly. Simply getting a spacecraft to Jupiter is an exquisite engineering challenge. And it took NASA six years to develop the Juno mission. But Juno was launched on a steamy Florida day in August 2011. And it was put into a giant gravitational slingshot toward Jupiter that took five years and crossed 1.7 billion miles. Just think about that for a second. That's the equivalent to over 400,000 times around the world, at an average of 39,000 miles an hour. And as Jupiter's strong gravity pulled it in, Juno became the, one of the fastest human-made objects ever, traveling at over 150,000 miles an hour. And at that point was the most nail-biting moment for the mission. Because then Juno had to slam on the brakes. It had to fire its rocket engines in reverse to slow the craft down and enter into orbit around Jupiter. I remember sitting in a room with all the other scientists waiting for the signal to arrive. We were all on a knife edge. We didn't know what was going to happen. And when the signal came, there was sheer joyous relief. We had a mission. This tough little probe had made it against some pretty tough conditions. We didn't know what Juno was going to be flying into. We had a good idea, but no actual data as to what was going to happen. An unrelenting magnetic field, lethal radiation levels, violent projectiles that could wipe out the spacecraft at any moment. So when the signal came, we were utterly joyful. So. The mission uh, was a, a success, and now Juno, NASA has been, or Juno has been orbiting uh, successfully, successfully for, um, for nine times. And um, it is bringing back a, a picture of Jupiter's composition that is really um, uh, revolutionizing uh, our understanding of Jupiter. By measuring the levels of water and ammonia in Jupiter's atmosphere, it's telling us where Jupiter formed in the solar system. Little wiggles in the spacecraft's motion tell us about the interior structure of Jupiter. See, scientists have been arguing for decades about whether Jupiter has a solid core in the center. And, and that's because we can make plausible mathematical models about what's there, but without any actual data to tell us whether there's a core there or not. Juno has been revealing some clues, but also puzzles. You see, it seems that Jupiter's core is there, but it's bigger than we expected. It's fuzzy and possibly partially dissolved into the surrounding planet. You see, what's um, mystified me so far about the Juno mission has been seeing the solar system's most powerful magnetic field up close and in a new light. So, Jupiter's magnetic field is huge. If you could stand in your own garden and look up and see Jupiter's magnetic field, it would appear as large as the sun in the sky. Its enormity drives auroral displays that can flare up to over a thousand times brighter than the Earth's own auroras. Now, I've studied Jupiter's auroras from afar for over 15 years using the Hubble Space Telescope and on paper. But this is the first time we've sent a spacecraft directly over the auroral poles. It's the spacecraft equivalent of kicking the tires to see if our ideas are right. So you see, we think that Jupiter's 
auroral oval is caused by sulfur dioxide, which is thrown out by, volcanic, by volcanoes on Jupiter's moon Io, which is the most volcanic body in the solar system. Jupiter's rapidly rotating magnetic field acts like a propeller, flinging this material away from the planet, and in doing so, generating hundreds of thousands of volts across the magnetic field. The auroral glow is caused when this voltage slams charged particles into the atmosphere and make it glow. At least that's the theory. Juno has been providing an opportunity to test this, and it's been showing us Jupiter's auroras in a way that we've never seen before. This, on the left, is a picture of Jupiter's auroras. The team applauded when they saw this picture. It reveals to us the beauty of Jupiter's auroras in a way that we've never seen before. The stripes, patches, and arcs reveal a complex uh, system that we're only beginning to understand. I'm sh pretty sure there'll be more surprises like this as the Juno mission progresses. But already we've seen some fantastic images. Juno has been showing us what's going on in the atmosphere near the poles that look completely different to the planet that we're used to seeing. Juno has shown that the the iconic stripes that we remember from science classes are just the tips of structures which extend deep down 250 miles into the Jovian abyss, as far as Juno can see. Enormous fountains of ammonia have been, have been seen deep in the, uh, in the atmosphere near the equator. Huge hurricanes the size of the Earth have been seen jostling around the poles. And of course, Juno has shown us the great red spot it sent back pictures which reveal the chaotic power of this iconic storm. I'm pretty sure that Juno will continue to surprise us as the mission progresses. But nothing lasts forever. Radiation will eventually triumph. Juno's electronic instruments will succumb to the, uh, the, the violence, the radiation of Jupiter's domain. You see, Juno is a tough little probe. It's there thanks to some uh, amazing engineering. It's actually the first solar-powered spacecraft to be sent to the outer planets. Three 30-foot-long solar arrays, together with 18,000 photovoltaic cells, together provide only 500 watts of power. That's about a quarter of the power that your kettle uses to boil a cup of tea but it's enough to provide all of the instruments on Juno with warmth, power, uh, warmth and power. Another challenge at Jupiter is the radiation. It's one of the most lethal places in the solar system. Fortunately, Juno is built like a tank. Its, um, its delicate electronics are sheathed inside thick titanium. And, uh, and its orbit is such that it dives in, quickly gets the treasure trove of data, and gets out of there. And as I say, it's already done this nine times, but that radiation will eventually win. Now, due to something called planetary protection, we don't want to lose control of the spacecraft, because especially near Jupiter's remarkable moons Ganymede and Europa, See, these moons are special because they could possibly hold an ocean beneath their surfaces. And where there's liquid water, nutrients, and warmth, there's the potential for life. Now, NASA won't want to contaminate a possible biosphere. And so Ju Juno will be safely deorbited into the planet. It'll be plunged down into the atmosphere where it'll burn up and it'll become part of the planet that it's helped us to understand. This may occur next year, it may occur the year after, we don't know, it depends on the health of the spacecraft. But what we do know is that while Juno's mission will end that day, its legacy won't. Its data will continue to help transform our understanding of Jupiter, just like Galileo's telescope transformed his understanding of Jupiter. Now, for Galileo, the state of the art of exploration was an expedition to the new world, which is just the starting point for Juno's 1.7 billion mile journey. How far we've come. He would be utterly astounded by our achievements and our discoveries. But the curiosity that drove him to point his telescope at a point of light in the sky 
is the same instinct that compels us in this mind-bogglingly technological age to send spacecraft far into space, to gaze with giant telescopes at the universe beyond. This compulsion to understand our surroundings and our relationship with them is older than history itself. Each new discovery of the sheer scale of space and time is at once both humbling and yet elevating for humanity. Every time we dare to venture into the unknown, we discover truths way beyond our imagination. It raises new questions and it inspires new generations of scientists. So, after Juno, we will go back to Jupiter. We'll go back to Saturn. I think we'll go to Uranus and Neptune and probably even beyond because we're explorers. Thank you.